Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the webinar. I am Shannon Grimsley, the Assistant Director of External Training and Partnership at the Woodward Hines Education Foundation and the Get to College Program. As everyone is jumping in the webinar, we want to um, give everybody a little bit of time to get in. Um, so we wanted to run over a little bit of housekeeping. So during the presentation, we cannot see or hear you, but feel free to use the chat box or the Q&A at any point during the webinar um, to send us your questions. Um, we will address those either during the webinar or after the webinar. So again, as everyone is um, jumping in, we wanted to do a little bit of little poll with everyone. So our, our poll question is, according to the NCAA, how many college students participate in athletics over all three divisions, D1, D2, and D3? So we'll give y'all a few minutes to answer that question. All right, it looks like um, our responses are kind of trickling in, but um, so two of you answered um, 460,000, and that is actually the correct answer. Overall, in all three divisions, there's about 460,000 college students participating in athletics over all three divisions. Um, the 175,000 you see there is representative of D1. Um, the 110 is representative of D2. And then the 2,600 is representative of D3. So um, quite a lot of students participating in uh, NCAA athletics across the United States. So thank y'all for um, participating in that poll. So again, uh, welcome to the webinar. I'm Shannon Grimsley, Assistant Director of External Training and Partnerships for the Woodward Hines Education Foundation and the Get to College Program. We are recording today's session and we will send a link at the end of this webinar to anyone who is registered. For those watching today's recording, today's date is October 3rd, 2023, and the material in this webinar is current through the 23-24 school year. In today's session, what educators need to know about supporting student athletes, you will hear from a college compliance officer and academic advisors about the way in which our colleges and universities are working to support their student athletes. I will now share a little background on Get to College and a few logistics about the webinar before we get started. Get to College is a nonprofit program of the Woodward Hines Education Foundation. We have three centers in Mississippi, one in Jackson, Ocean Springs, and South Haven, and we help parents, students, and high school counselors with all aspects of the college planning and financial aid process. And all of our services are 100% free. In our centers, we offer personalized college counseling appointments where we can tell students when to apply for admission and scholarships, help fill out their FAFSA, the free application for federal student aid, which remember will not open until sometime in December, this year. So October 1st is looking a lot different for us this year. Um, and then we also can advise on essay writing and interviewing. So as we mentioned earlier, during the webinar, we cannot see or hear you, but we do ask that you um, ask us questions at any point during the webinar through the, the chat and the Q&A. My colleague, Chelsea Williams, will be on the back end um, checking those questions and answers in chat and we will uh, monitor those as we go along. So feel free to ask our presenter any question. Speaking of our presenter, I would now like to introduce our guest speaker for the day. Marcy Hutton begins her third year as the Assistant Compliance Officer and Academic Advisor at Mississippi College. She joined the staff in June of 2021. 
a committed professional to education prior her, to her time on the MC campus, Hutton worked in the Clinton Public Schools as a math and science teacher at Eastside Elementary School for four years. Before her time at the Clinton School District, she also served as a math teacher at Pearl Junior High School. Marcy gained knowledge in higher education as she volunteered at the Mississippi College Student Success in Athletic Advising and Compliance during the two years prior to joining the staff full time. The Pearl Mississippi native received her Associate of Arts degree from Heinz Community College in 2012 before earning her Bachelor of Science from Mississippi State University in 2016. She also holds a Master of Science from Mississippi College. Welcome, Marcy. We're very glad to have you today. And we are now going to turn the presentation over to you. Good morning, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with Get to College and to be able to speak with all of you today. Most experiences that I'm going to speak about today are going to be based off my time at Mississippi College and what that's looked like for me so far and what opportunities and things that we provide for our student athletes. Um, my role is, as they said, and thank y'all so much for the introduction, an academic advisor, assistant compliance officer, but I will be focusing more on the academic advising side today um, to give you some good supporting information of how you can help your student athletes um, as they plan to transition to college. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background information about what my job looks like on the day today because I, I thought it might would help provide some context for us. So what I really like to start with is I consider myself a liaison between the student athlete and the faculty and the coach and the faculty. And that's kind of what my role looks like here. So at Mississippi College, we have faculty advisors that help students register for classes and that help keep them on track to graduate. And those advisors are really housed within each department. So for instance, if you're a business major, you're gonna have a faculty advisor that was is a business professor, but that also provides you, um, we, you have meetings every semester when it's time to enroll in classes and they sit down with you and talk about your degree plan and what classes to sign up for. I kind of like to talk about that a little bit to separate that from what my role is because academic advisor can be loosely interpreted. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit more, a little bit more about what I do with student athletes. So I meet weekly with a group of student athletes, um, returners who have a 2.3 GPA or lower, newcomers and transfer students I meet with based on recommendations of their coaches. So our baseball team at Mississippi College, they set their priorities high and they have any student who's transferring in, whether it be their high school transcript or um, a JUCO transfer, they'll meet with me if they have a 3.0 GPA or below. And so it just kind of depends on the sport, but academically for our department wide, it's a 2.3 GPA or below. Um, but some point, some sports like to heighten those requirements. Um, I also meet with a group that we call here the foundation students. And those are students at MC who are admitted on restricted admissions. They may be admitted because they didn't meet the ACT requirements or they didn't meet the GPA requirement from their high school, but they went through an interview process. They wrote a paper and they were able to still be admitted to MC on this foundation um, program. And they're in this co cohort throughout the first year. And so instead of jumping straight into classes like composition one or college algebra, they'll take an English 100 level course and a math 100 level course that we kind of walk through it with them to help kind of bridge any gaps that they may have and help them be successful. And then they also take a student success course that helps them um, talks about different skills building that they could use to be successful in the classroom at the college level. So those are the groups of students that I meet with weekly. It ends up being about 60 to 65 students and we have a one-on-one -on -one meeting for about 15 minutes and I meet with them. I get a copy of a syllabus from all their courses at the beginning of the semester and we discuss the assignments that they have coming up. We discuss test grades. We discuss how to communicate with your professors. We discuss um, tips for success along the way. And so that's one of the things that I do at my job. Another thing that we have at MC is called an early alert system. And so what that looks like is like for me is every Monday I come in, I run a report and any of my student athletes who are on the early alerts 
uh, report, which pre professors can even can report whether students have a failing grade or whether they're not attending class on that report. I'll share that with my coaches and then I meet individually with those students as well and try to intervene and figure out what we can do um, to solve the issue that they're having in that class. We do have study hall with for our student athletes that are required. Um, all students who are newcomers have to attend study hall, whether you're a transfer or a freshman. And um, returners, if you have a 2.49 GPA or lower, you have to attend two hours of study hall a week. And if you have a 2.2 GPA or lower, you have to attend three hours of study hall a week. That's monitored and hosted by our teams. So for example, our football team, they have a classroom in their field house and a it's about eight to 11 Monday through Thursday, their coaches assigned to them when they are to come. And we really do that to help designate a time for our student athletes who have such busy schedules to give them that time to go ahead and sit down and this is your time to study and help build that into their schedule. Students can replace study hall hours with tutoring. And so my job with study hall is I help coaches kind of set up all their study hall times, but then I also monitor it um, because we have study hall penalties when students didn't do not attend. So if you don't go to study hall or you don't meet the requirements uh, the first time, it's an additional hour the next week. The second time it's a mispractice. And then the third time it's a missed game. And then if you keep missing after that, you will be held from the games. Another part of my role is I monitor progress towards degree for our student athletes. So the NCAA requires when any student athlete is in their fifth semester or further, they are required to take courses that go toward their degree and so at the beginning of every semester, I do a check. Um, although our students are required to meet with their faculty advisor to know what to take, they do sign up for classes on their own. And so sometimes they'll see a class that's at a time that they like better. And so they might make that change on their own and we might have to intervene and make sure that they're in those right courses that go towards their degree to set them up for success um, so that they remain eligible. And then at the end of the semester, I report those to the NCAA on our eligibility list. I meet a lot with students to talk about major changes and to help them build degree plans. We'll look at um, different degree plans and ways that they can get to the same goal, um, depending on what they're wanting to do with their sport as well. But our biggest goal here is to see students graduate. We host academic workshops for our um, student athletes during their off season. So we just recently had one for our spring sports, spring and winter sports. And it was by, led by our faculty athletic mentors, which we have here at MC for each team. Each team has a faculty athletic mentor who will just kind of be a support system, a faculty member. They can call and ask questions, but then they also attend the games. We're really trying to bridge that gap that I know you guys see at your schools between academics and athletics. And so that's just one of our ways of doing that. Um, and so they came and discussed different professional expectations, email etiquette, traveling and how students need to um, approach traveling in the classroom. And then recently I've started an Instagram for our student athletes where I'm trying to post um, good information for them weekly. We have a student athlete newsletter that goes out on that. Um, and on that newsletter, we'll host information like a student support service that we have on campus. And we'll always host information on different skills building like this past month, I think I did time management. And then I try to send out a graphic about Tip Tuesday. We kind of do a Tuesday thing too, um, where I send out something to our student athletes that might can help them with midterms coming up. I just recently sent out a Tip Tuesday that included studying tips. So I know that was a lot of information, but I wanted to tell you a lot about my role so that you understand what capacity I work with students at, but then you also understand what resources our students are having. Obviously every college is going to be different, but that's the way that we tackle things at um, Mississippi College. And I speak frequently with other institutions and they seem to have very similar programs or initiatives um, in, at their school as well. So at Mississippi College, we have 18 NCAA affiliated sports and I am the only academic advisor for all 18 sports. And so I get an opportunity to work with a variety of students from different backgrounds, from different high schools all over the state. Um, and some of the things that I wanted to share with you first is what I hear from my incoming new student athletes. Um, it never fails that I have a student athlete tell me that they never had to take notes in high school. Um, so they don't know how to take notes. 
they don't know how to do assignments um, and they don't know what to do about that. And so I had a student this past week who told me he just didn't do an assignment because he didn't know how to do it. I have students with 4.0s on their high school transcripts who come in and they say, I've never had to study before. I've always just gone to class to listen and I did well and I didn't study. And so they may not do as well on their first exam. Um, and then I have students who will tell me, well, I don't have time for that. And we'll talk a little bit further about um, each of these statements, but I kind of wanted you to hear what I'm hearing so that maybe these are workshops and skills that we can start providing for our student athletes while they're in high school so that when they get to the college level, they really can start from the beginning and being successful. So that's what my whole presentation is going to be based off is these statements. I did want to start with some things that I think student athletes must know. All students need to know this information, but for student athletes to know it from the get-go, it's going to help them be more successful from the beginning. With student athletes being taken out of class so often with their travel schedules, um, our football team, their first week here, they actually missed the whole second week of class because they went to Miami for a game. And so it just shows you that was a really rough start for them academically with them being out. And so having all these skill sets and things I'm going to talk about can really help um, them be academic, academically successful um, within regards to the challenges that they face. So the first thing that I see a lot is we need to tell students how to read a syllabus. I'll tell you nine out of 10 times a student will come to my office and I'll ask them for a syllabus from their class when they're in my weekly meetings and they'll say, oh, I threw that away. They gave it to us, but what was I supposed to do with it? And so it's important that we're telling them what information they can find on there. Because usually once they realize what information that syllabus hosts, that's when they're like, oh, I really do need that. So some of the information that I like to point out that's important is professor at office hours and contact information. Student athletes really need to know how to communicate with their professors, but they need to know how to get in touch with them. And so having knowing when their professors will be in their office or knowing with, what their email is, some of our professors will have a, a phone number listed. It might even be their personal phone number. And so those are good things to know in case of emergency and they need to contact their professor. A lot of syllabus have due dates, um, grading scales. Not all college classes use the same grading scales. We'll have a class that may have a 65 is a passing grade, and there may be a class that requires you to have a 70 to be a passing grade. And so knowing those grading scales, and it can be unique um, to each department on our campus. So where business may have a higher grading scale, like they may do a seven point grading scale, um, and then in our English department, we have a 10 point grading skill. So it's just knowledge is power and it's information that they need to know ahead of time. Um, assignment expectations. A lot of times syllabus will have information about what assignment expect expectations students have. And so that can be helpful for our student athletes, giving them the opportunity to look ahead and knowing what they're going to have to do to complete the assignment. And then the biggest one at MC for us is the attendance policy. Um, I know sometimes at those bigger institutions like D1, they may not always take attendance in those classes. I do think they're getting more into it now because students can really just scan their ID card and that's how they take attendance. And so, um, but a lot of institutions are taking attendance and our attendance policy at MC is, is if you miss 25% or more of the class, you receive an automatic F. That does count against you when you miss for athletics. Um, which I know is shocking. And it so, and what that kind of breaks down to, if you meet in a class that's three times a week, so Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you can't miss more than 12 where it's an automatic F. And a Tuesday, Thursday, or two times a week class, you can't miss more than eight. And then in a once a week class, you can't miss more than four or you receive an automatic F. Now, obviously some professors are willing to work with you, but it just kind of depends. And so we sit down and talk with our student athletes about that at the beginning of the semester, because we do have to, when they miss for um, competition, they are excused from class. However, it, it still counts in that total number of absences. And so our students have to be even more proactive where they're looking at their schedules. They're going to see how many times I miss in that class and they need to prepare for it. I can't tell you how often a new student will come in and maybe they'll have changed their schedule within the first two weeks and they forgot to tell their coaches and their tending weights instead of going to class. 
And so that's an issue that we face a lot, but then they're not aware of the attendance policy and the fact that they've already set themselves up for failure because they've mess, missed too many and they're going to have to miss for games. And so it's really, really important that they have all this information before the class begins and they understand all of the um, implications of it. Something that I see so often are students coming to college not knowing that they have to pay for books. Um, books, and they don't budget for that. And so they'll, they'll come here and they'll just not get books and they'll make that choice for themselves. Um, with our students not being in classes at time and missing lectures, if they don't have the book to go and follow up with the chapters and read, that really sets them behind. So it's important that they understand how books work at the institution. At our school, um, our bookstore, you can charge a, a, as much books that you need to for throughout the very first week to your student account, and you actually won't have to pay for it until the end of the semester. And so you have that opportunity, but you have to do that within the first week. Um, and so that's something that's really important is getting knowing the deadlines, knowing that academic calendar, and knowing all of that information. And so. Also, a lot of times when our student athletes do miss that deadline, I try to teach them how to use other sites like Chegg and Amazon and how to rent books and how you can get used books and just having that information of knowing how to access that. And so I think that's really helpful. And, and the professors usually include what the book is on the syllabus. So it just all goes back to that syllabus for me. A lot of times when I have students coming in, um, they feel like a fish out of water because in high school, they feel very comfortable with those uh, teachers. They've had, they've either had them or known them for four years. Most of those teachers know, especially senior year, they're an athlete, they play, they know about them. And so um, when they come here, our professors don't always know who's a student athlete, especially our freshmen, um, just because they're so new. And it's not like there's a big red flag on the student's account that says they're a student athlete. Um, so they really have to be able to communicate with their professors. I encourage our student athletes, I meet with the freshman uh, football team for sure uh, every fall right before they start. And I say the first thing you need to do day one, whether it's before class or after class, you need to go up to your professor, you need to shake their hand, you need to tell them your name, you need to tell them you're an athlete and tell them you're looking forward to being in this class. Um, because it, it just seems that I have so many um, who are timid and to talk to their professors. And it goes such a long way when they bridge that gap and they're able to communicate. And so I th think that's something that, you know, letting our high school students know um, how to communicate with professors and when to. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, but when it, I told you in our panel that we did for our academic workshop that we had our professors come and speak about email etiquette. And something that I found really interesting and took away from that is, our students will um, address, I'll get addressed frequently as Dr. Marcy, um, very flattering, but I do not have my doctorate. And so just knowing when to use doctor and misses and misses and where to find that info. But one of our professors said that he feels like a safe bet if you do not know is to respond or is to address the um, professor as Professor Smith or Professor um, whatever their last name may be. And so that that's one way that you could probably communicate to um, your student athletes of how to send emails and you know when when's it a good time to go talk in class and when's it a good time to go ahead and send that email um, just to give you some experiences that I had these are all experiences I've had this week by the way and I know it's only Tuesday but I had a student come in who missed an assignment on Thursday and he did not um, send an email to his professor because he said he was just gonna go see him on Tuesday and talk to him about it in class and I said well, that isn't so all weekend long. It doesn't really seem like you cared about that, that assignment. Um, you didn't go ahead and let him know that you noticed right away that you missed. And, you know, I always tell them if you miss an assignment, you send an email day of um, and you make sure when you send that email, you explain what happened and then ask for partial partial credit. The worst thing that they can say is no. And then you're in the same position. But if you're not even going to address it until five days later, at that point, the professor's not going to want to help you. And so really just when to go talk to them in person and when to email is, is a really good thing um, 
because unfortunately it's it's easy to miss an assignment that happens and so they need to know how to address those things um one more experience i'll give you is i had a student who uh came to mc last year great kid but every time he would send me an email everything would be the entire email would be in the subject line like he wouldn't use the body of the email and so talking about what to put in that subject line, class title, we use 700 ID numbers. So using those ID numbers and then also putting that good, valuable content. And um, I, I always tell them, it's not what you say, it's how you say. And so just keeping those things in mind and how to communicate with professors. Um, also as student athletes, it's vital that they're building those relationships with their professors, which they can start on day one by introducing themselves. But because they're gonna have to communicate so frequently with missed classes and with having to do makeup assignments and makeup tests, our professors prefer that our student athletes reach out to them before they miss the test. So if they have a test on Friday and they're traveling on Friday, they want our student athletes to reach out on Wednesday to see when they can make up the exam as opposed to waiting until after the fact. And so, um, and a lot of times, as you guys know, as educators, when you get to know a student, you're wanting to help them more. And I try to tell that to my student athletes when our professors are humans too. If they're just getting random emails from someone they've never spoken to in class, they're not gonna feel inclined to wanna say, okay, I'll give you an extra chance to do this. However, if you take the time and really get to know them and show that you care, they're gonna wanna help you. Um, and so that can go a really long way. Okay, so at the beginning of the semester, I try to go over with my incoming students on what it takes to be successful for uh, student athletes at the college level. And I feel like these skills are things that students need to know before they get here. Because although this outline's really good on how to be successful in a class, it's important that I include some information um, that they need to know some discovery of these things and what they can do beforehand or how they do it beforehand. And so we'll kind of go through this real quick. One of the biggest things I like to talk about is being proactive and not reactive. So making sure before class, you print out those lecture notes, um, reading the sections to be discussed and take notes on the material. So that takes having the book, but also knowing how to summarize notes, how knowing how to read something and then summarize it in your own words and then coming prepared with questions. Those are things that can be really, really helpful to do before class, um, especially if you're gonna be missing the class. So during the class, I always tell the student athletes to sit near the front it's very often that I have a professor call me and say, I've got someone sitting in the back, they're a student athlete, they've got their hood on and they're watching film. You know, those are the things that we've got to talk about, being alert, being at the front of the class and taking notes is a huge one. Um, I think as educators, sometimes we assume that our students should know these things when they get to this level. And so I, and that was a mistake I made when I first got to MC, I thought students would know how to take notes at this point. Um, and then you'll even see your students who were really successful in high school may not know what works best for them taking notes. Um, and if you'll go to the next slide, I kind of showed you one of the note taking skills that we'll talk to them about. And it's the Cornell note taking skills, you know, writing the main ideas and then putting the details next to it. And then after class, going back and summarizing all of that. Um, and, and so helping those students discover what is their best note-taking strategies. I mean, that could be a really cool workshop for student athletes to have beforehand where they take the time and they're understanding how do I best take information that's being given to me and put it into words. And then also just during class, asking those questions always. Anytime they can just go ahead and have that confidence to ask the questions um, so that they are able to be proactive on that. And I always tell them if you don't wanna ask a question, shoot an email, stay after class, you know, but just make sure you're asking them. Um, but students just need to know what strategy works best for them. Um, and then just one more thing about the notes on the first day, uh, when I'm, we meet with our student athletes in a compliance meeting um, before they go into their first classes. And so what I tried to tell them, make a friend on day one, who's not a student athlete. Um, because when you do miss, you need to be able to ask someone, can you send me the notes you went over in class? I mean, obviously you've got to use the lecture, you've got to use the book, but you also need to be able to find someone who's in that class who takes good notes and you're able to um, borrow those from them and look over those so that you have some additional context in case the professor did say something that's not in any of those sources. Um, and so that's important. 
And then after class, when students are taking a college course, they need to complete the homework, rewrite their notes and summaries, and study. Um, and something recently I've been working with my students, instead of rewriting the notes and summaries, um, I've always said, because you know, not everyone works best from rewriting something. As we know, everyone has learning different, has different learning strategies and different things that work best for them. Um, something else that they might could do is just reread over their notes for 30 minutes, you know, and maybe quiz themselves, flip those notes over. But I'll tell my student athletes, when you're in study hall, you set a timer on your phone for 30 minutes and you put do not disturb on. And for 30 minutes, you reread over those notes and you see what you can take away from it. And then almost try to teach aloud to someone else. If you have someone in front of you, you can do that too. Or if well, if it was like me in college, I would talk to a brick wall so I could sit there and re-say my notes. Um, and so those are just little tips. And I know this is all um, information that you guys as educators are fully aware of, but just knowing that our student athletes are coming to us and not always knowing these things, this is stuff that we could help them um, know from the get-go, even our students who have those really, really good high school GPAs, just because they may not have always had to think at this level um, and so studying and tutoring if needed as well. And so, as I told you, I have a lot of students come tell me that they don't know how to study um, because they've never had to do it before. And so just talking about some of these skills with our student athletes could go a long way of creating a study place or an environment that works best for them. I always say, let's not do it in the dorm because Students' bodies are tired. Our student athletes' bodies are tired from weights, from running, from working their bodies um, to the max each week. So the second they get in their dorm, those, those rooms are really small. There's not a lot of places to sit. They're going to sit on their bed. They're going to fall asleep. They're not going to have their full focus. And so the best thing to do is to find a place outside of their dorm room so that they're able to study. Um, we have a library. We have study rooms on campus. In our alumni hall, which is where we have like our Chick-fil-A, they have these chairs and there are these little pods and they kind of like cover your head a little bit and they have outlets in them. And it's just a nice, good, cozy place where you can sit and no one will talk to you and can really um, study. So finding a good study place, um, teaching students that when they do study, you know, don't cram, don't look at it the night before. You need to plan in advance over an extended period of time. Um, taking 30 minutes a day for about seven to 10 days leading up to the class can be a really, really good way um, to get some of that studying done as, as well as not, don't sit there and study for longer than an hour. I feel like our student athletes brains are always racing 10 times more than the regular student because they're always thinking about what's next and what they have to do next. And so just taking that time for an hour and saying, okay, Okay, this is the hour I'm going to study on my math class, or this is the hour I'm going to study on my science class. That can go a really, really long way. Um, I have a lot of times people will come see me and they didn't do well on a test and they'll say, well, I studied all the PowerPoints and I listened in class and they're not taking the time to make connections with the book. And so just making sure they're utilizing all the resources that they have. Um, so looking through the book and making connections through the book with the PowerPoint. Um, and so that's going to be really important um, because not always will the professor go over everything that's in the book if they're expecting the student to read the book ahead of time. And um, Using resources, I am not sponsored by Quizlet, but I talk about it enough that I feel like I should be. I uh, love me some Quizlet. A lot of times they can go into Quizlet and they can Google a professor's name, the name of the course, and they can find a Quizlet for that exact test that's already been made. Um, and so there's no reason to recreate the will. Obviously obviously take that Quizlet and look at it and make sure it aligns with what your notes are and maybe add to and change it up as you can. That's more to make it relevant. But using that, um, Quizlet has a great feature that is really helpful to athletes. They can download it on their phone as an app. And there's a feature called Learn. Um, I live by it. But what students do, it makes multiple choice questions. And it allows them, if they get the question wrong, it's going to continue to bring the question back until they get it right. And if they get it right, it's going to go away. And so you'll do that until all the questions disappear. And then you can go in and you can create like a test for yourself. So if you know the test is going to be multiple choice discussion, fill in the blank, you can go and Quizlet will actually make you a test. And that's all on the free account that you can do that. So you don't have to pay additional for that. Um, and then there's the flashcards and there's a matching. And 
a lot of times my student athletes are very active students. Um, they're used to, you know, moving their bodies a lot. And so for them studying, just reading over it isn't going to be beneficial for them. So having different activities to, to study can be really, really helpful. Um, studying old homework questions or quizzes, taking old homework questions and quizzes and putting those in Quizlets can be also a really cool way for them to um, get that study time done. And the biggest one I want to talk about is planning ahead of when to study and what to study. Even in my job, I feel like sometimes I look at my to-do list and I'm like, I'll start working on one thing a little bit. And I'm like, oh, wait, I need to do this because this is more important. And I'll start working on this a little bit. And then I'll trickle over here to this other thing. And then someone will walk in and ask me a question. And then I'm doing something totally different than I set out to do. I think when they identify the time of exactly what they're going to be doing during that time. Um, and that takes knowing their whole schedule. So whether that means using a Google calendar or a planner and writing out when they're gonna practice, when they have weights, when they have competition, when they have classes, when they are going to eat, cause that's a huge one. Um, cause nutrition is so important and we've got to feed our brains. Um, and when they're gonna sleep, well, then all they've got to fill in after that is free time and study time. So if they write down study in their planner, that's great. But then they need to even break it down even further. I try to encourage my student athletes to make lists. And those lists are to be in order of importance of what's due first. And if they take that list and they see, okay, I have a test in two weeks. So I should probably start setting aside either 20 to 30 minutes um, every day leading up to that test. And I know during that 20 to 30 minutes, all I'm doing is looking at that test material. And so they could say the first 20 or 30 minutes, I'm going to be creating a Quizlet. Day two, I'm going to start reviewing that Quizlet. Day three, maybe I'm going to look through the PowerPoints, you know, and then those are the things that they really need to do is they need to know what they're studying and when they're studying it ahead of time. And that kind of leads us into our next topic, which is time management. Um, and I should have cited this. I found this on the NCAA Division II website, and it talked about an average D2 student athlete, because I do work at a D2 institution, um, what percentages they spend doing um, their everyday life. So 22% spent on academics, 18.5% is spent on athletics. 9.2 is spent on socialization, and then 50% is spent on sleep, job, and extracurriculars. Um, many of my students have jobs on campus. Some of them have jobs around town. Um, a lot of them are in, we call them tribes and clubs here, but they're uh, popularly, pop, <laughs> popularly known as sororities and fraternities. So a lot of them are involved in different events um, on campus. And so it's really important that they realize that 22% for academics is not a ton of time. And so it's important that they're utilizing that time well. So I wanna talk a little bit more about what our student athletes face as an athlete in a day-to-day. -day. So a D2 student athlete is allotted to practice in countable athletic related activity also known as CARA, for 20 hours per week. Um, they have to have one day off and no more can they do than four hours a day. That's when they're in season. So that's when it's the worst. So 20 hours per week, um, one day off, and then four hours a day. So let's talk about some of the things that are CARA or countable athletic related activity. Some of those things may look like workouts, practice, strength and conditioning, or film review. It's really anytime they're getting together and they're talking about their sport and a coach is involved, it's considered CARA. Things that are not CARA, but our student athletes are still required to participate in are academic meetings, whether that be with me or our workshops, injury treatment and prevention with our athletic trainers. Um, if there's a recruit on campus, they may have to host in some sort of way, whether that means going to lunch or, you know, giving a tour or just kind of being there so they can meet some of that our recruit can meet some of the teams. Fundraising throughout the community. Um, we did a com community service project last week as a department where each team went out to different places. We had our, I know our men's basketball team went to the stew pot. And so just different things like that, they're always trying to get out there and be involved in. Compliance, we have compliance meetings frequently. I think we had one this past week on drug and alcohol prevention. It was this past Thursday night. We had some Texas um, Rangers come in and speak to all of our student athletes about that. 
other meetings. So they may have coaches meetings. They may have um, meetings with their professors and then study hall. So those are all things that they end up doing as athletes that are um, a part of them being an athlete and that there's so much more that they're having to do too in their everyday life than just that. And so we'll kind of talk a little bit more about how we can help with that time management and what that might look like. Because knowing that skill, knowing how to manage their time ahead of time is going to be so helpful. So setting weekly goals and creating checklists. I know these are things you all know about, but just teaching those student athletes how to do it. Because a lot of times I'll tell my students, we'll just make a checklist and they'll say, where, how, why, like, what am I going to do with this? And so a lot of them like to utilize their notes app and it, it allows you to actually check a box on notes app if you set it up the right way. And so they'll put everything that they have to do in there. And then if you're like me, I am really satisfied when I check something off my list. And so I think, you know, with an athlete having that reward of, yes, I finished it. I'm done. It's almost like scoring a goal. And so I think that can be, um, really, really helpful, making sure they make that time in their day to get sleep and to eat. Our cafeteria is open, I believe from 11 to two, but sometimes they'll have classes during that time because um, they're trying to make sure they don't have classes during practice. And so just making sure they plan in when they're gonna get their food um, and then just utilizing all those resources um, that we have for them to be able to manage those time like Google Calendar or planners or I'll have students come and see with me, sit with me one-on-one -on -one and we'll go through their Google calendar and I'll help them color code things and get things organized so that they're ready for the week and they know exactly what to do. And I only do that once. The time after that, you know, I'm trying to coach them so that they can do that on their own um, because that's really what we want to see from our student athletes is that they're taking these skills that we're teaching them either in high school or teaching them in our workshops and they're utilizing those skills. Um, we don't want them at any point in time to think there's going to be someone who does this for them because then that's teaching them nothing. And so we really, really want them to learn these skills and then use them on their own. So um, something that I thought would be helpful is for us to talk about the resources that we have at Mississippi College for um, all of our students, but also uh, our student athletes. And it's very similar. You'll see at most institutions will have these resources. I've, I've talked to some of our competitors and they also do have these resources for their student athletes. So the library uh, on campus, if your student doesn't have a computer, they can always go to the library. They can print in the library. And there's also those individual study rooms in the library. Our library also has a writing center. So our writing center is to help when you're trying to write a paper at any time throughout the paper writing process. So it can help at the beginning, the end or the middle, you can go to the writing center. Um, and the way we do it is they have face-to-face -face meetings, they have online Zoom meetings, or you can submit your paper and receive feedback through an online portal. So our student athletes who are traveling, they can submit their paper and say, hey, I need help with APA formatting. And they'll get some advice and some tips and some resources back on how to do that. And so that's huge. Um, a lot of times too, high schools, when I was in high school, it's been a minute, but they used MLA and now APA is such a big thing. And so I don't know if high schools are using APA 7, but that's what we're using across the board on campus here. And so, you know, just being having somewhere they can go and talk to those people about what um about how to do those citations or maybe it's just the flow of the paper but our writing center is really helpful for that and they're they have great availability especially accessible for student athletes who have such busy schedules um tutoring so tutoring we have athletic tutoring and we also have departmental tutoring so we have athletic tutors available monday through thursday night and they're only available to our athletics because we wanted to make sure from 6 to 8 p.m. that students have a place that they can go and get help if need be. We do it at nighttime to hopefully avoid those practice times. Now, obviously, if they're traveling or there's competition, they're not really able to utilize those tutors. So they have to be proactive and using them from the start. For example, um, I try to tell my student athletes who are struggling often this scenario, if you're in a math class and you're watching the professor do the problem on the board and you're like, okay, I get that. But then when you go and do it by yourself, it's like you're in the trenches. Um, it's very similar with their sport. You know, when you're 
sitting there and you're talking to your coach and he's giving you that game plan of what y'all are going to do. Like, this is the play we're going to run. You're like, okay, I get it. I'm going to go here. And that's exactly what I'm going to do to run the play. But then you go out there and you run the play. And for whatever reason, everything's not lining up. Everyone's not getting to where they need to go first. Maybe they're being blocked. They're not able to get where they need to go. And so the play's not getting done. Well, y'all don't just go about your lives and say, okay, well, we'll figure it out on game day. That's when we'll figure out the play. No, y'all run the play over and over and over and over again. And that's the same thing that I'm trying to get our student athletes to know is you've got to practice those math problems that you're having over and over and over again, or whatever those assignments, whether it's history or math or English, it's the same concept. And the best way for them to do that is tutoring because with them having lack of time, they don't always have the time to sit down and you know, go look up Khan Academy or go YouTube and teach themselves. They have a resource where they can go and someone will teach them all of this information. Use it. Doesn't mean you're dumb. Doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you. You know, it just means that you're smarter for taking care of your business and going and getting it done. So we have those athletic tutors. We also have our departmental tutors. Our departmental tutors um, is within each department. They have like a tutoring time and schedule and they can utilize either of those. Um, they're welcome to go anywhere on campus for tutoring. It's all free to our students. Um, college resources they have is utilizing their advisors, um, you know, whether that be their faculty advisor or their athletic advisor, utilizing those and building relationships to know where they're at in their degree plan and ask questions when they have them. I always tell my new students, if you have a question and you don't know who to ask, ask me. I'll help you figure out who to ask. I might not be the right person, but I'll put you in the right direction. So just keeping those things in mind. Different offices that we have on campus that can be helpful is the Office of Student Success. Um, they have uh, advisors in there who do very similar things that I do campus-wide, but then also they host different skills building workshops on campus. So if a student were to come from high school and they didn't know how they best take notes or they didn't know how they best study, they can either meet one-on-one -on -one with someone in our Office of Student Success and they can help them figure out those things and discover those things for themselves, or they could go to one of those workshops. They also do really fun events. I think they had like a scavenger hunt last week um, where they taught different skills throughout the scavenger hunt. And so they try to keep it fun for them. We have an Office of Accessibility Services. So students who are coming in with 504 plans, um, to get their accommodations, they need to go meet with accessibility services. Um, I have so often this semester, it seems like I've taught with, I talked with two or three students who told me I got accommodations in high school, but I just didn't think I needed them anymore because I was doing fine. And I was like, well, you were doing fine in high school because you were getting the accommodations. And so just knowing that they have to be their own advocate and bring their documentation to our accessibility services so that can trickle over um, and that they really, really need to move forward with it. It's a very confidential thing as it is in um, the high school level. And so it's not like they're going to be caught out for it. No one's going to know, but they need to go ahead and get those accommodations to best support them. We have a mental health service on campus where they meet one on one with um students will do counseling it's free to all students I think we have about three counselors and we also have a sports a GA counselor right now who is able to meet one-on-one -on -one with students even if they're struggling with something in the game mentally they're able to meet with them a lot of times having a sports counselor she is a former athlete and former athletic trainer is really helpful because they're kind of able to understand some of the things they're going through a little bit better than maybe um or, the, or maybe the student even feels they're being understood better when they're meeting with someone who's been in the athletic world. And then we have an Office of Career Development and our Office of Career Development is very helpful. They'll help with resume building. They'll do mock interviews. They'll do internships. They have an aptitude test um, through U-Science that they use where if the student is in their major but they don't know like what area of their major they want to pursue after college, they'll help them discover that. Or if they're they don't know what major to do at all. They can take the aptitude test and kind of look at what might be a good fit for them. They help the student athletes get on campus jobs. They have a career fair and they also do um, simple things about telling students what to wear to interviews and they'll really help in any capacity when it comes to the career aspect of things. And so those are the college resources that we have on campus and that um, when really are utilized can really help student athletes be successful all, all across the board. And so some trends that we see in successful students are students who are successful are motivated. They know their why. Even if their why is to play their sport, I'm okay with that. 
Um, but they have to know to play their sport. They have to be successful in their academics because if they're not, then they're going to be deemed ineligible and they're not going to be able to compete and they're not going to be able to play their sport. And so they have to take that so same motivation they have at practice and they have to apply it to their classes. So knowing their why usually helps my students be successful. Utilizing all those resources I just spoke about and resources I've talked about throughout this presentation. Communicating with their professors, um, collaborating with advisors, and then taking ownership of their education. I know that at the high school level, you guys often hear from moms and dads and parents and guardians. And at the college level, uh, we often hear from moms and dads and parents and guardians. And so it's important that students understand that it's their education and that they really take that into their own hands and that you know, a lot of times we can't even talk to parents but without a FERPA waiver. And then it still just depends on the capacity of what they're wanting to speak on and speak in. But when students really understand that, hey, this is my responsibility to talk to financial aid, not my mom's, that's when they really start to buy into this whole process. And then we're able to see them be more successful. So those are things that we find really helpful. Okay, so I want to ask real quickly if anyone oh I think we'll ask questions and answers at the end this is a guide for college bound student athletes that the NCAA puts out um, it's really helpful I think we're going to put it in the chat as well as they're going to send it in an email that comes out after this uh, webinar but it'll talk more about the compliance side of things, the courses that students have to take to be able to be a qualifier upon graduating. It talks about what they should be doing now if they're a freshman, a sophomore, a junior to apply for that amateurism. And um, I'm always happy to answer any questions if you have it. My email was at the beginning of the presentation, but just to give it to you one more time, it's mhutton at mc.edu. And I'm really happy to pair with all of you guys in any capacity because as a former Mississippi educator, I have a big heart for it. My husband's a Mississippi coach and teacher. And so anytime y'all have questions, please just reach out. I have people do it constantly and I'm happy to help um, as I can get to you. But does anyone have any additional questions or anything that I can help with? Kelsey, did we have any questions come in in the chat or the Q&A? No? Okay. They're just being shy, Marcy. Um, <laughs> and your your information was great. Um, Y'all, please feel free to reach out to Marcy. As she said, um, you know, fantastic information that we can use with our high school students as well, right? Um, and getting them prepared for college. So thank you again. So much for being here. I'm sure folks will follow up with you um, as they have questions. So I hope everybody found this presentation helpful. As I said earlier, we will um, email you the recording for this webinar. Y'all will get that tomorrow. Um, and then we'll also post it on our YouTube channel for folks to refer back to at any time. So if you have any follow up questions, please feel free to, to reach out to get to college or to Marcy. Stay tuned for our next Topic Tuesday webinar, which will be on Tuesday, November 7th. And during that webinar, we'll be discussing um, all the things that students need to consider in the transfer process. We will consider uh, continue this webinar series through the fall and spring semesters. And if you participate in five webinars, you will have the opportunity to apply for 0.5 CEUs. And if you participate in all 10 webinars over the fall and spring, you will have the opportunity to apply for one full CEU. The remaining webinars for our fall and spring semesters are listed on this slide as well. Those webinars are listed under our educator heading on our website and then select Topic Tuesday under the event section. While you are there registering, please check out all the other resources for you and your students listed under that educator tab. We will have lots of training opportunities for educators over the 23-24 school year, and we hope that you will register for the, as many of those as possible. So I wanted to highlight a few of those. Um, we have upcoming uh, in the next, well, this week and next week, we'll have a few um, college educator, college access educator trainings, which will be in person at our South Haven Center this week and our Ocean Springs Center next week. It is not too late 
to register even for that one this week in South Haven. So go to our website if you'd like to attend those. And lunch will be provided for both of those as well. It's going to be kind of a lunch and learn style. Um, what, I, what I know you all have been waiting for is our uh, virtual FAFSA training. Uh, we hope by the end of October, we are going to have all the answers to the new simplified FAFSA. And we're gonna offer that to you in a variety of ways. So we have four different virtual trainings at all different times of the day in October, November, and then one in January. And then we will be offering in-person trainings at five locations across the state to hopefully um, be close to uh, everyone across the state and have everyone have the opportunity to jump into that training. Um, so we hope to see you very soon on our all of our trainings, and we hope to see you at the next Topic Tuesday. And as we said earlier, feel free to contact us at any time. So thank you again, Marcy, and we look forward to seeing everyone in November. Thanks a lot, y'all. Thank you. Thank y'all.